Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, welcome. My name is Gosia Kuczmowska, and I am based in Warsaw, Poland. I am the logistics and personnel specialist of the Global Leaders Program. I would like to start with a few housewarming requests. If you are using the web version of GoToWebinar, please switch into the desktop version of the app by clicking on the flower at the top right corner of your screen. Please write your name and country of residence into the chat box. We want to hear from you. Before introducing today's guests, I would like to share a few words about our organization. The Global Leaders Program offers an Ivy League curated executive graduate certificate in social entrepreneurship and cultural agency each year to an international cohort of 50 musical change makers distinguished by proven accomplishments and a persevering commitment to excel. Led in partnership with nine top universities, among them Harvard, Duke, Georgetown, NYU, and McGill universities, the GLP's teaching faculty includes Nobel laureates, Grammy winners, and TED presenters who work with and support cohort members throughout a nine-month journey that combines online and in-person university-led courses and retreats with on-the-ground fieldwork in more than 40 countries around the world. Facing the pandemic, the Global Leaders Program initiated a series of events designed to support the continued growth of sidelined institutions and professionals from the music sector. So far, these open enrollment webinars have involved the participation of practitioners from more than 30 countries around the world. We feel honored to have you all here and we do hope this initiative will keep helping you get through these challenging times. Today, as public officials, managers, and presenters, as well as board members, navigate a complex question on when and how to responsibly return to performance activities in venues, the Global Leaders Program and the Spanish Association of Symphony Orchestras with support from Foundation BBVA are co-presenting a new initiative, Resetting the Stage. From public health to economics, from event production to communication strategy, each conversation convenes a diverse group of industry experts to engage in examining next steps for the sector in a world transformed mm -hmm. by social distancing. Now, it is my great, great pleasure to introduce today's illustrious panelists. Mr. Benedict Poor, Chief Executive, Hong Kong Philharmonic. Benedict has held CEO positions at Ensemble Recherche Freiburg, Kamerata Salzburg, Orchestre Philharmonique de Luxembourg, Deutsche Radio Philharmonie, and since April 2019 is now with Hong Kong Philharmonic Orchestra. Sophie Galais, Managing Director, Melbourne Symphony Orchestra. Sophie joined the orchestra in 2016 as its first female managing director, having previously held CEO positions at Queensland Symphony, Quebec Symphony, and Orford Arts Centre. A member of the Advisory Council of Harvard Business Review, Australia Institute of Company Directors and CEO of Institute of Australia, Sophie began her career as a flutist in Europe. Maria Grantman, Head of Negotiations, Swedish Performing Arts Association. Maria is Head of Negotiations at this association, an employers and industry association representing over 100 cultural organizations within the field of theater, music, dance, and circus in both private and public sector. Mark Pemberton, Director, Association of British Orchestras. Before joining the association, Mark was CEO of the National Operatic and Dramatic Association, the UK's representative body for amateur and community theater, during which time he served as chair of Voluntary Arts England. He is currently chair of the UK National Music Council. Dr. Juan Antonio Cuellar, CEO, Sinfonica Nacional de Colombia. Colombian academic and social entrepreneur, Dr. Cuellar, has been CEO of Fundación Batuta and Dean of Graduate Studies in Music at Universidad Javeriana. He is co-founder of Filharmonica Joven de Colombia, 
Executive VP at Fundación Azteca and CEO of Orchestra Sinfonica Nacional de Colombia. Resetting the stage will be moderated by the Global Leaders Program alumna and manager at the Spanish Association of Symphony Orchestras, Natalie Osa Azate. Natalie, welcome. If you would like to share a bit more about the partnership between our organization, please do. I pass the word on to you. Thank you, Gosha, and welcome all to this first session for the series Resetting the Stage. Um, in the past weeks, weeks, we've been shocked by the crisis created by the world pandemic, and we've been facing new and unexpected challenges. So now we would like to concentrate our efforts on thinking and creating this new future that is just ahead of us. So we joined the Global Leaders Program with the aim of a start and inspiring and productive discussions, putting together all these wonderful industry experts from all around the world, because we believe that this is a time for sharing information, but it's also a great opportunity for sharing ideas, best practices, and reinforce our music sector. So thank you to all our panelists for accepting our invitation to be here. Uh, all of you, by the way, in different time zones right now. And thank you to all the participants for joining us in this important discussion. So mm -hmm. like we have limited time and very interesting subjects, I would like to ask our panelists to briefly explain the current situation in their own countries or regions following these uh, four points as a start. So the first one is about the general state and the government measures in each country. So please share any dates and information about the beginning of the lockdown, if you had a lockdown or if you have a lockdown right now, the general impact of the virus in the society, if you are not in a state of alarm, what's the general economic, social uh, health or security measures that have been taken. And also if your country has some specific measures for the cultural sector or for the music sector, and if there is any changes in the public funding for music organizations right now. So that's the first. The second is about the employment of musicians. So are the orchestras receiving an unemployment aids? Are freelance musicians receiving any economic and support right now? Are, are freelance musicians, soloists and conductors receiving compensations for the cancellations of concerts? The third point is about the ticketing. So we would like to know if the orchestras and concert halls are refunding the money for the cancellations of concerts. Uh, if the subscribers are asking for that this money to be returned and if the orchestras are reprogramming the same concerts for next seasons for the future or not. And the fourth point, it's about our near future, about the next season. Um, are the orchestras presenting the season normally, or you cancel the presentations of seasons? Uh, is there a date for the end of the current ban of public events? When are you planning to start the rehearsals and when to open for the public? And are you thinking to start with full audience or with reduced audience? So I know that this is a lot uh, to be addressed in 10 minutes. So we will go directly to the matters uh, before I uh, would like to ask to the attendees, if you have any questions for the panelists, please write it down in the chat box that you will see in your control panel. And we will start answering all the questions just at the end of the panelist interventions. So please keep in mind um, that the questions should include your name, the country of residence, and the name of the panelists that you would like to address your questions. So I think that's all for now, and we can go directly to Benedict. So welcome, Benedict, and please tell us about these four points from Hong Kong. <clears throat> Hello, good morning, uh, or good afternoon, everybody. Um, well, um, I'm happy to share a little bit um, our situation here from Hong Kong, which is, of course, a little special, as um, Hong Kong is uh, quite small. We don't have so many. Um, professional arts institution in Hong Kong, but we are very much um, connected internationally. So dependent from artists coming to us from abroad, 
and um, of course our artists are also very much um, internationally um, active. So uh, and we are close to to China where the virus apparently um, started. So right in the end of January, um, the Hong Kong government was very attentive and. In the last week of, of January, suddenly um, stopped all the public performances. And at, the, at that time, it was um, exceeded from week to week. Uh, so, of course, by the time then, um, artists, international artists started ask, asking um, if it's secure to travel to Hong Kong, um, uh, if, are, there, are the concerts going on, and so on. So. Um, after some weeks, this um, this um, shutdown was uh, extended to two or three weeks, and then the situation was um, again um, situated. But um, it was clear then by mid of March that um, there, there there will be no um, no opening um, of the concert halls for for another time. So uh, the the venues um, were, were closed until um, four weeks, and then um, now. They are closed until end of May for now, and we wait for the government to decide if the venues might open for smaller um, orchestras and smaller audience than than in June. But so far the situation is not too bad at the moment in Hong Kong. Of course, there are still um, travel restrictions until mid of June. Um, no, no international artist is allowed to come to Hong Kong. Only Hong Kong residents are allowed to return and then have to to be in quarantine for 14 days. Um, the um, economic situation is is uh, quite bad in Hong Kong at the moment. Um, also, because we had uh, protests going on um, in the last uh, six months, so the tourists um, um, didn't really come to to Hong Kong, and um, the government is uh, is um, quite anxious to. Um, how, how the situation will be in the in the coming coming months. I think that's so far for the first uh, for the first uh, question from my side. Um, employment of musicians, um, the orchestras and and uh, cultural institutions are still on pay, and there was no no um, orchestra or, or institutions which had to um, release their their um, their uh, employers. Um, uh, the, the government is very supportive, I must say, for cultural institutions. There is a relief fund to pay um, freelance musicians and um, uh, freelance uh, uh, helpers and uh, um, um, people um, who are usually um, freelance uh, hired by the artists, art, arts institutions. Um, so there, the situation is, is not too bad. We, we, for instance, we could pay our our um, substitutes for for two months in full, and then for the for the um, remaining months after April for 50 percent. Um, we don't pay, and here um, the the, the um, clause of force majeure applies. Um, uh, the soloists and conductors um, coming from outside. So um, this is, of course. Uh, not a very good situation, but I think it's not. Um, otherwise, it's not possible to handle it. Uh, ticketing. Um, uh, we we um, refund all the tickets, um, uh, and we asked also the the ticket holders if they might consider to um, to donate their tickets for our student ticket funds, which means um, we can use the, the the donated money when the concerts resume to. Um, to um, support uh, the students and, and the, and the, and the um, school, school we have we have this program already, and we ask the the, um, the audience to donate to this this fund. Um, when uh, the the concerts resume in normal, where well, we hope we can start in a normal season in in September, um, not knowing if the travel restrictions are still on by that time and not knowing of course um, if the audience will be um, allowed to to come back in 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 hundred percent so we revised our budget and um, for the moment we calculate with 60 percent an audience in the venue um, 
to be on the on the more careful side. Um, of course, we we are also discussing now internally with with all institutions and the government under which conditions we can open the venues, um, like um, uh, for the audience, what kind of security and health measures we should take, and for also for the orchestra, of course, how can the seating be, will be in which size the orchestra can be on stage and what what lengths the programs can have. So these uh, discussions are going on, but I think we, and we, are, we hope very much that we can open by, by September. Maybe in June already in small formations, and, but um, this is not, not sure for the moment. So that's so far from Hong Kong. Great, thank you, Benedict. I think you gave us a very, very general and, and a specific at the same time view. So, Sophie, we're going to you to Australia, which is, by the way, 3 a.m. for you. So thank you for being here. My apologies if, uh, if I don't sound fully awake. Um, thank you for inviting me. And um, here in Australia, uh, in January, when Hong Kong uh, was uh, in the midst of it, we were watching what was happening in China and Hong Kong. And we have a large population of um, Chinese origin and Asian origin here, 24% of the population in Melbourne. So we were looking very much at what was happening. Um, and we saw actually a decline in audience coming to our concert from that point on. Uh, in March, March 16, uh, the Australian government announced um, strong measures um, and uh, we started having um, the, the, the pandemic crisis. I would say that actually when I look around the world, we are not so bad. Uh, there is uh, 6,800 cases of COVID-19 in the whole of Australia and only 97 deaths, uh, which is very unfortunate, but it is a very small number, number compared to um, uh, the UK or the United States, if I think of it. Um, so the government has, in, um, has imposed strong measures right from the get-go, and uh, we have seen three phases. So a first stage where on March 13, the government announced a ban that was starting on March 16 for events of more than 500 people. Three days later, we went down to 100 people and a couple of days later to 10 people gathering. Uh, so when that happened, what happened here at the MSO um, on March 16, when the whole country went dark, we decided um, live stream from the stage of the concert hall um, around the world and on YouTube, so free to air. It was very interesting. By the end of the concert, 5,500 people, so double the size of the hall, had watched online. And uh, by two days later, we had more than 100,000 from of people from five continents um, watching uh, the concert. So it was a great experience that I and kept going and we uh, started the program on digital that went uh, to as far as we could uh, following all the, the measures. So that's as for when we will return. So the halls are closed. They were closed first, the first phase uh, to mid-April. Then the government announced a second phase of closure till the end of June. And we already know from the government that they will be announcing a third phase, most probably going to the end of September. Um, it's quite unfortunate because when you're not sure, you can't cancel the concerts that are happening, let's say after June. Um, so you are like, oh, what do we say to the agencies who have artists? who probably would not be able to travel to Australia. As we are a continent and an island, our government, one of the first measures that was imposed is a ban on international uh, travel. So we are in a lockdown, but really no one can come to Australia. And um, the, we have only two airlines, two major airlines, Qantas and Virgin, and Virgin has gone under receivership. So it's uh, by now we have only one airline and it's only military or um, international aid that can travel. 
So we are here looking very much at the news and trying to see when we will be able to travel and um, um, get some artists from overseas to come to Australia. And the, um, what, is being, what we're being told is most probably in 2021. So that, and we don't know exactly when in the year. As our season, our calendar year, um, and not like in the Northern Hemisphere where you go from September to May, we go from January to December, um, it will have an impact on our season. Um, so the, is, the government did not announce specific measures for the arts. They announced program that would be across all industries, so a little bit like in, in the UK. We have a program called Job Keeper that is actually an allocation of uh, $1,500 per fortnight uh, for everyone who can, for every um, institution, organization, or companies uh, that want to retain their employees. And uh, the other option is to go on unemployment. For um, independent artists, until recently there was nothing. I so saw there was there was no um, uh, security uh, net, um, no help. But last week the Victorian government here announced um, financial aid for um, independent artists. So that is um, a little bit of relief for them. So when that happened, the MSO um, employs 400 um, musician, permanent, casual, and staff. And uh, we made a pledge to try to keep our casuals um, with this job keeper measures um, for as long as could be so that uh, we would provide this um, security, even if it's a very tiny amount, uh, so that people would still receive some funding. As for international artists, guest conductor, guest artists, we are like everyone else with a force measure clause. And I think my, my heart goes to the artist agencies because it must be so hard for everyone uh, who has to stay home and with no, uh, no means of support. Um, ticketing, so we are refunding tickets for the, the concerts that have been canceled, but we are actually, we have dynamically transformed this into, okay, um, talking to all the customers that have bought tickets and asking them if they would uh, tr convert that into a donation for the orchestra. And I know that around the world, this is something that is uh, being done. We have approximately 30% a rate of conversion and so for a team a box office team that is normally uh, used to um, convincing people to buy tickets it's very depressing to see a sea of red so reimbursement reimbursement so now we have targets of conversion which is a better way and uh, to celebrate the accomplishment of the team um, are we going to reprogram the same programs most probably not because when we talk to artist agencies from around the world um, their artists are booked for next year doing something else elsewhere. So it's quite complex, but we, we are still very willing to reprogram things. Because of the international travel problems that, that we don't know when we will be able to travel, and the most probable quarantine of 14 days when an artist will come to Australia, we have been uh, designing a 21, we had an international season for 21, now we have redesigned a focused on Australian talent, Australian uh, amazing um, artists start of the season, and we are still hoping to get international artists later on in the year. So normally you announce a full season, we've decided to go and announce it per quarter, so three months at a time. So UP, we come out of the lockdown, hopefully by the end of 2020, and then start 2021 in a celebration of amazing talent from Australia. And then hopefully, gradually during the year, we will be able to um, bring back some international artists. Being a very isolated, only six professional orchestra in Australia, uh, we have decided to collaborate with our colleagues. I meet with them every week. We have decided to share artists. So if an international artist is interested in, in traveling to Australia, we can offer them most probably at least a month of concerts in a row. Um, and as um, I think that's a, um, 
we are like everyone else uh, looking at um, um, social distancing in the hall on stage smaller program most probably um, smaller um, size orchestra um, and um, that's going to be quite interesting Thank you, Sophie, very, very much for your enthusiastic and very informative uh, participation. Uh, we would like to encourage all the participants to write down in the chat box the name, where are you from right now, from, from which country are you joining us today, and maybe your organization, if you, you are part of some music or, or, or institution, music organization or institution. So now we go to Sweden with uh, Maria Grunman. Okay, uh, I was just trying to ask if I could show one picture at least, but we'll save that for later and see if it's possible. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, I'm really happy to be part of this and um, now I'm also trying to find my notes, yes. Uh, well, uh, as I'm sure you have noticed, Sweden has had a, a bit of a different approach to the, the pandemic uh, preventions and I would like to start by telling you that the situation in Sweden seems to be under control by now. Uh, the hospital situation in Stockholm has been in control. There has never been uh, a shortage of intensive care units. And now the, the level of, of um, sick persons and, and are starting to decline in Stockholm. And the expectation is that next week, about a third of, of all the inhabitants in Stockholm will have had the COVID-19 uh, disease. That's uh, an estimation. Um, of course, there, there will be a continued spread in Sweden, but hopefully we have learned especially how to prevent it from spreading in the houses of elderly, which is the biggest failure in Sweden, that um, the uh, hygienic standards weren't high enough to, to stop it from spreading. But that also has been starting to decline now. That's where the, the biggest negative effect has been in Sweden. Um, of course, it has been uh, a negative effect on the economy. And uh, for instance, we expect to have a, an unemployment rate of around 10% next year in Sweden, which of course is not as bad as in some other countries, I think in Southern Europe, some of you expect around 20%, which of course is even worse. The economy in Sweden has been and is rather strong, so the, um, the possibilities to aid now and, and especially later to restart the economy are still quite good. But of course, the problem for our members and for the, for the orchestras and the opera houses is that the fight for or the, the competition for public funding will be even worse. And even before this crisis, that was the biggest um, concern for our members that we see that the, the funding is slowly decreasing compared to other sectors. And if I would start with the government measures, uh, the, um, we have had no uh, lockdown in Sweden, as you know. The only harsh decisions are against public gatherings. And the 11th of March was the first uh, ban of gatherings of more than 500 people. That is only in the audiences, not uh, counting the orchestras, but still uh, now since the 27th of March we're down to 50 people in the audience and that for most of our members, the orchestras in Sweden has meant uh, a close down. Um, and that is until further notice, so we still have no, no uh, information about when this is going to end, but probably sometime uh, nearer to, to the summer, we expect to have a, a bigger amount of, of audiences to be allowed again. Um, there are restrictions for um, entrance to Sweden, so um, non-Swedish citizens are restricted and uh, restaurants and shops are open, but they have restrictions. So safety distances of one and a half meters are, are to be um, arranged and if the shops or the restaurants can't uh, control that they are shut down mm. and that happens. Uh, we have only recommendations from our um, public health agency but as you might have heard in Sweden people actually follow these recommendations so the effect are more or less the same here 
uh, as they are in other countries. Although you can always find television photos of people gathering somewhere in the city. But if you go out, you see that shops and streets are rather empty at the moment. We have had no demands of masks. Uh, but actually today, for the first time, the public health agency said that you might consider in the homes for elderly to staff, for staff to wear masks, but it's still not a strong recommendation. It's one of many things, but actually they, they um, warn people of if you wear masks and you keep touching them, you might even increase the risks of getting the disease because you touch your face more with a mask. Um, we have had some general support for short time uh, work and lowered pay, but that usually does not apply to the public funded orchestras. So very few of our members can get that kind of support. Um, but you have general support that, of sick pay that the state covers the sick pay for the full period, not like before the, the employees have to pay for the first two weeks. And you have possibilities to have subsidized rent. Uh, but the, the state support for the culture sector, that is mainly for the, the uh, more independent sector. So, of course, some of the freelancers, the musicians who are freelancers, they can apply for that support. And also the private theatres have some musicians, they can do that. But the public funded theatres and orchestras and opera houses usually do not get that support. Um, and... Uh, most of our members of the orchestras are publicly funded, so they lose money, but the orchestras actually are the ones who lose the least. Some even gain. I mean, when they don't play, they even save more than they lose in ticket sales. Um, <clears throat> but the opera houses, on the other hand, are, one, are the worst um, because we have opera orchestras as well, and they really... They, they lose the most because they have already spent everything. And when they come to the last, to, to the, the premiere, they are supposed to get some back and they don't. But of course, the, the funding for this year is not retracted. So, so like you said before, you keep uh, your musicians uh, on their employments for now. But the, the concerns are for next year and the year after that, because we see this is going to be a long term crisis. Uh, the tickets are sometimes refunded. We, our uh, advice to our members is that they do not have to refund if it's a force majeure situation, but they do sometimes anyway. But they also change uh, for, for vouchers. But when it comes to artists, the contracts, if they are not employed, they also can be terminated on force majeure basis, but they have different kinds of... of, um, of um, of um, deals instead of, of postponing for next or even the year after, or sometimes uh, they pay part of the, the contract for the near, near term contract. The others sometimes are actually canceled. And it also depends, of course, sometimes the artists cancel because they can't find a flight to come here. So there are different negotiations there. Uh, the ticket sales for next year have started. And actually some of them say that there is a big interest. They do uh, open ticket sales. So if they actually can't go in, in the autumn, they will refund these, these uh, tickets for the whole year. Uh, when it comes to the orchestra's measures, um, which I would like to say is about next season, but already this season, is that there were some initial shutdowns by the orchestras for maybe two or three weeks. But after that, our members have already started rehearsing and giving uh, live concerts that are streamed or they record digitally and put them out on their play channels on demand. And it has been an actual digital boom in Sweden with some had already prepared and some are doing for the first time now so many recordings and con combined with live performances outdoors actually, outside houses for elderies, elderlies, but mostly it is a lot of live streaming and and recordings for the play channels. And um, for instance, the, the Stockholm Symphony Orchestra, they've had 350 visits. And one of the concerts had three and a half thousand visitors or public digitally. 
and they get reviews. They get actually audiences from Australia and Germany, and they had reviews in The Guardian. So it really is a, a, a fantastic example of how this situation has spurred a lot of invention and, and new development. And we hope that this will continue after this situation. And uh, uh, I will tell you a bit about it in the end, but when it comes to the planning now, they do actually plan for a possible opening this summer or this autumn, but parallelly they plan for continuing developing the digital um, performances. Also, it is important for those who have had their funding and will not lose the funding for this year to show that they actually are producing, they're delivering to the audience, to the public for their, their money. And when they do this, they have also voluntary restrictions of one and a half meters in between the musicians and two meters in front or behind and um, no other special measures than the, the, the regular. And mostly what the reports I get is that the musicians are okay with this. There are some who are worried or have conditions that make them more vulnerable. And then, the, of course, they stay at home or they may be coming just by themselves to make a soloist recording or they play in, in, in smaller groups. And um, this initiative has uh, all, all these kind of digital um, productions are partly um, managed through the collective agreements that our organization managed to, to make in the early beginning, already in March, with our unions for the musicians and for the, the actors, that they actually saw the possibility and also the need to, to reach out and to make it possible to, to show the, the, what they are doing. So this is founded on a mutual agreement with the musicians and that's something that we are very proud of both our organizations and the musicians well, that's great and, uh, yes yeah. i think that's yeah that's did uh, that cover all your bullet points yes thank you very much very very efficiently thank you maria um, thank and you. i think with the student um situation it's very different because you did all these collective agreements as, and also because you didn't went to the lockdown and you don't have like the same measures hygienic measures that it's happening all around the world so thank you very much for that and now we are going to UK with Mark Pemberton from the British Association of Orchestras. Thank you Natalie and, and greetings to everybody who I cannot see but I know you're out there and I will try to make this as brief as possible. A gr greetings from the country that now has the second highest number of deaths in the world. We go UK, we're doing great. Um, we are in a pretty bad way, I have to say. We've had a government that really hasn't had much of a clue as to what to do. So I was on a call with our Secretary of State for Culture on 3rd of March, where the Deputy Chief Medical Officer of our country assured me and everybody else working in culture and sport that there was no prospect of, of closing down mass gatherings. Um, uh, by mid-March, that all started falling apart. So initially, we decided that we would be like Sweden. Uh, we would be nice and lax and we'd let people um, look after themselves, but we wouldn't impose, uh, tell them what to do. Um, we then decided that we'd, uh, that wasn't quite working so that we would not shut anything down, but we'd tell people not to go to any, any um, theater concerts or anything. Just don't go, but we're not actually closing them. That didn't work either. So eventually on 23rd of March, the official edict was out there of, of national lockdown. We have absolutely no idea when that's going to finish. Um, we are stuck with it now for eight weeks. There is no plan. There is, we have not seen, as other countries have, a kind of phasing of how things will reopen. We are still very much shut down and have no prospect of knowing when that will happen. So what impact did that have on orchestras? Absolutely profound. You have to understand that in the UK, um, as we share with Australia, our levels of public subsidy are much lower than on continental mm -hmm. Europe. We do not get 80% of our income from subsidy. It's more like 25 to 30%. And we, uh, my orchestras earn on average 50% of their income through ticket sales and commercial activity and recordings. So, and the remaining, so 30% subsidy, 20% fundraised, 50% earned. So you're seeing the entire eradication of all of their earned income. This is absolutely disastrous. So initially, 
every single orchestra was automatically bankrupt on a, on a long-standing national shutdown. The government did implement some, rush through some business support measures. So we get the same business support measures as any other business, which is a furlough scheme, giving 80% of salary up to a maximum of two and a half thousand pounds a month, and a self-employed income support scheme, where our research shows that 30% of freelance musicians are not eligible. Again, you need to understand in the UK that we have 2,000 permanent uh, members of orchestras. 1,000 of those are uh, salaried employees. The other 1,000 are freelance, are self-employed, but have a regular member status. And then there's 12,000 casual opportunities for freelancers on top of that. So these business support schemes are absolutely essential to keep our orchestras going. They are only scheduled to last to the end of June. We do not know what happens after that date, but all concerts have been cancelled through the summer. Um, and we are assuming that we're not even back in business in September. We are currently working the assumption that we are out of um, commission till the end of the year. So we have no idea if the government switches off its business support measures, my members are in serious difficulty because, of course, there are still costs going out. There are premises, overheads, things that we can't, and there is still a core of management staff working to try to keep the orchestra going. Um, ticketing, I can't really tell you very much about that. Uh, all I know is that advanced sales are not looking good. Season, seasons are indeed on sale, but it's not doing very well because customers just don't know. And there's a whole issue about customer confidence. Will people, even if they can go to concerts, will they want to? Um, especially as we have a more a, an older audience who may be less comfortable about going into a confined space. So what we know is, is looking like even if, and as I say, this is what we're seeing in other European countries, there could be a, a we might be told we can open our doors, but subject to these public health restrictions. Which are, which are going to mean that customers will have to, the audience have to queue up to get in, wash their hands, no food and drink, possibly wearing face coverings, only one in every four seats sold in the hall. Um, it makes no practical or economic sense to operate concerts on that basis. So it's unlikely that really the, the venues are going to be prepared to open their doors for concerts under those uh, restrictions. Uh, we, so we only, we, we have to be looking to a situation where we return to normality. But will we ever return to normality? The digital developments are interesting, but we are not being given any money to pay for that. Any digital activity has to come out of existing subsidy. Um, and we are keen to see if there is a monetization model that works to put dig digital concerts out to market and bring some ticket income in, but we're struggling to get there at the moment. Um, so really, I haven't got a very optimistic picture. It's not going particularly well. Um, then this then, as a global leaders program, sets up challenges for leaders. And that's what you really is, is how do we help the people who are running these orchestras navigate their way through this extremely challenging situation? Because um, the other news we had today is that the UK now faces its deepest ever recession. Our economy will contract by at least 14% this year. Um, but it may be that the economy will recover in 2021. So we just look to 2021 as when maybe we can get back to some semblance of normality. But I'm not sure how many of my orchestras, how resilient they will be to get through to that point. So fingers crossed, we'll be all right. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much for your honest intervention. And we are going to Colombia with Juan Antonio Cuellar from the Sinfonica Nacional de Colombia. Thanks, Natalie, and uh, greetings to everyone listening and observing this interesting panel of discussion in this exceptional time. Uh, we in Colombia, like in all the American continent, were have been the last to get into this uh, global tragedy. And uh, 
some countries have taken stronger measures and some weaker measures. We see that, for example, the U.S. is suffering through a very uh, complicated situation. Um, Ecuador has gone through a very dramatic situation as well in Brazil. Colombia has taken measures uh, from very early on. So um, in March, the middle of March, I, I had to tell all, to all my, the members of the orchestras that all concerts had been canceled and that we were going to stay home till further notice. Uh, these, uh, the government started the shutdown uh, around the 20th of March, and we have been in quarantine ever since. Uh, now they, they are telling us that maybe uh, we are going to start to, to some normal activities in some fields of the economy uh, beginning at the end of the last week of May. Um, so this has had a very dramatic impact in the economy. Um, additionally, um, due to the fact that our countries in Latin America have a great percentage of the population uh, working in informal jobs. Uh, so um, unemployment is going to be dramatic during this crisis and after. The government has taken some measures to provide some, some uh, support to unemployed uh, people. And even um, those employees from companies that are underpaid due to the situation, they're going to get a compensation from the government, which is very nice for, for thousands of families. Um, including those families, of course, um, the, the ones associated with musicians in symphony orchestras have been affected. And we have uh, different types of orchestras and especially different types of funding for these orchestras. Uh, fortunately, the National Symphony Orchestra is uh, supported by the, the national government uh, on the head of the Minister of uh, Culture. And so it, it's pretty, pretty much the same situation with the Bogota Philharmonic and the Medellin Philharmonic and some other orchestras that all orchestras around the country that have uh, public funding. But for those freelance or uh, funded by private organizations, um, the situation is quite different. We have uh, a number of colleagues that are now uh, without any pay trying to survive and trying to bring their families through uh, this process. So it's, it's, a, it's for some of our colleagues, it's actually a very difficult time. So we have uh, started um, uh, some sort of a number of actions through the union of the orchestras to help those colleagues that are uh, suffering. Um, so, so these measures that the government has taken are, are going to be um, in some way, they are going to easy the situation for this for these uh, colleagues, but it's it's not clear when they can or we all can be uh, back into the concert business uh, from which many of those orchestras uh, survive. Uh, in terms of employment of musicians, well, I, I said that the, these different categories. What we see is that uh, probably in the near future the funding is going to be less than it is normally. I, I, we are expecting for the, the rest of the year and even for 2021, uh, some funding cuts from the government to these orchestras that are uh, uh, funded by the, by, by the public sector. Uh, we don't know, but uh, what we're anticipating that something uh, of that sort will, will, will happen. So in terms of ticketing and, and uh, concert uh, sales, um, most of us, uh, have a system of ticketing that is uh, outsourced and they are taking care of uh, the refunding and they are taking care of, of the reprogramming of, of some of the um, events. For, for the National Symphony Orchestra of Colombia, we, we have decided to cancel every concert already programmed for the, next, for, the, for the rest of the year. And we are considering also the possibility of canceling every concert for the first semester of next year, uh, being realistic. Uh, at the same time, we have gone through a path of learning audio uh, to, to, to belong better with the audiovisual business. So we made an agreement with national TV uh, 
and radio. And we are starting to produce some materials with the musicians recording at home. You probably have seen a few of those. Uh, some orchestras in the world are doing this. And we're doing this in a very consistent way, pro producing at least one or two of these uh, very short videos every week. Uh, when, when we are allowed to go back into the theater, the National uh, Teatro Colón de Bogotá, we are going to start producing a TV uh, program, a TV series uh, about music and about the orchestra. And we're going to do this uh, audiovisual materials in the, pretty much in the language of the TV and, and commercial TV uh, broadcasting or programs. So what we are doing now is we are actually resetting the stage. We're, we're moving towards the audiovisual produ production business because that's what we think that is going to be safe doing. And we, we are going to, to be flexible enough to adopt to adapt the orchestra to the situation of the way we can record and film the orchestra. Not everyone together can be allowed at the beginning of the following stage. We are aware that the orchestra uh, in full cannot be performing at the same time. So we are going to take uh, advantage of the digital and uh, the possibility of manipulating the, 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 the recording process so we can uh, end up with very nice uh, outcome, but not produced in the, the traditional way that we have been uh, used to. And that takes me to say that uh, th when this happened, we, we basically realized that the orchestra has been pretty much uh, following the same path or the same model as in the 19th century. And now we are forced to take advantage of technology and to take advantage of the possibility of distribution and connection that we now have. So we are starting to become something that is very local, attached to a theater and to a particular community and belong and start becoming something more global and more uh, connected to the reality of many more people around our countries and the, and the, and the globe. What I, what I see now, when, when we released the first video, within a week, we had more than 3,000 views of that particular view, uh, video and more than 100 comments on YouTube. Uh, nothing of that sort is comparable to the performance on stage, where you can have maybe when we have uh, uh, totally uh, full house, we can have, we can get to around a thousand people or a thousand, thousand and two hundred people. Uh, and we get normally no more comments than four or five after a performance. Uh, so, so now this is kind of opening a new opportunity for orchestras. We have already uh, started recording uh, for, um, for a pop music producer, uh, recording from home. So there's also a new possibility for a new business for us. When we can get together to do this, maybe recording could be uh, more substantial for the activities of the orchestra. And uh, the other, the last thing I would like to say is that uh, many people in Colombia or elsewhere who had never had the chance to listen to a symphony orchestra or to, to know what a symphony orchestra is, through the audiovisual opportunity that we have to embrace now, are, are going to know and to start enjoying of this music. So our, our expectation is that when this thing is finally over, maybe in a year or something like that, if we are, if we are, if we are smart enough using technology, we are going to have many more people interested in attending our concerts. And for those, uh, especially in Europe and the US, who are uh, accustomed to an audience uh, of elderly, of people above 60 years old. Now we're, we might have the opportunity to get to those younger generations who would be thrilled to go finally after the crisis to a symphonic concert. Thank you. 
So thank you, Juan Antonio, and thank you all for your very interesting interventions. Sorry, it was the time, so you were in perfect timing with the 10 minutes. Uh, so we are going now to the to the chat box to answer some questions from the audience, if that's okay with you. So we're gonna start with Bradley Powell. He's asking from Canada, and he's also part from the Toronto Symphony Orchestra in Canada. So this question is for Benedict. What are the predictions so far from the government health officials regarding large scale events before meeting before a vaccine? Have government officials spoken about the timeline for cultural and sporting events returning to normal before a vaccine is widely available? Are you adjusting the beginning of your 2021 season accordingly? Some post-secondary institutions estimate as much as an 80% drop in attendance enrollment this coming fall. Well, the government, um, as I said, is um, only thinking in, in two, two weeks or three weeks um, periods. So um, at the moment, uh, we have um, gatherings um, uh, in open places, in, in public places, until 20 people, and it will be opened in the next stage until to, to 50 people, maybe in end of May, beginning of June. Um, we we are allowed when the venue is open in Hong Kong. We are allowed the the, the stage is regarded as a workplace, and and the workplace um, is is not part of this of this um, limitation. So in a workplace, in the office, you are allowed to work um, now normal. It wasn't that case two weeks ago. We had, there was more the, the, um, the, the um, advice to stay at home and to work from home, but now uh, it's uh, offices can work. So our office is also working. Uh, but um, when we open it then to, to, the, to the audience, um, there would be the limitation of 50 people, including the orchestra. So um, this is until end of May, beginning of June. We are thinking positive. I mean, of course, we all have this plan B uh, for the opening of the season, but um, um, we think that the situation might um, be relaxed um, in, in Hong Kong um, so that we can open in, in, in September with a reduced audience of 60%. Um, but the government doesn't give this number. The government um, is, is, as I said, deciding from more or less week to week here in Hong Kong. Does this answer somehow the question? Thank you, Benedict. Yeah, that was the question from Bradley Powell, that it's also an alumni from the Global Leaders Program. So it's good to know that we have alumni around here too. So uh, the second question is for Sophie. Uh, Sophie, this question is from Bador Biela. He's the executive director with the Wheeling Symphony in Montana in USA. So he asks, I have a question related to what are the plans each of the symphonies have to monetize any digital or streaming services until reopening? Yeah, um, <clears throat> good question. I think in, in Australia, most um, symphonies uh, did not have a digital plan or were streaming on YouTube maybe or Facebook some little uh, concerts or events. Now uh, we're forced to go fast forward and that's what MSO did. I'm very happy actually to see that uh, it's the best way to engage as uh, Juan was, was saying, it engages with much, many more people than you would normally get in your hall. So for example, the MSO by now, we have had uh, seven weeks of digital program and have had 350,000 people who have watched our concerts. While normally in a full year, in a full season, uh, we have maybe um, up to 400,000 people who come to our concert live audience. So we're very proud that in such a short period, we've been able to achieve such a large audience. Now, what we've done every time we've been on YouTube, it's free to air, so you're not getting revenues. Actually, you can get revenues from YouTube, but you need um, a certain numbers of hundreds of thousands of viewers, and the length of the view is, is one of the criteria that's very important. When, when YouTube 
starts getting ad money, advertisement, then you can receive royalties. We have started receiving royalties, they are tiny. I would not be able to uh, pay a fine musician for one concert with that, but still we keep going. Um, the model we are looking at at the MSO, because my, my other colleagues have decided to just uh, post on Facebook or uh, post former concerts that had been broadcasted in the past, which we are also doing, but uh, we're thinking of a model more like the Berlin feel where uh, you have a digital concert hall and uh, go behind a paywall for uh, your members so that if people are a little um, afraid of coming back in the hall and experience live uh, music, uh, they could decide to stay home and to a membership, uh, watch the concerts online. So this is something we're working on at the MSO. And we have a partnership with Unitel. Unitel is the company that was founded by Berlin Phil um, and uh, sells to broadcaster around the world uh, different concerts. So the, um, this is something that we're working uh, with them, with the National uh, Broadcasting uh, uh, Corporation. Uh, so it's something we're really focused on. Uh, investing in the digital world. Now, um, MSO is like a NUK orchestra, approximately 30 some uh, percent of public funding uh, dependent on our earned revenue. So we're actually fighting for our survival. We're not sure we will not uh, go tip over or we'll go down. Uh, so it's quite um, stressful, like I'm sure it is for all my colleagues to manage you know, <laughs> your survival and try to develop your future in a different future. So we're, we're really working like everyone else on social distancing, but at the same time as, and returning in the hall, but uh, trying to maybe stream from the stage, even if there's no audience in front of you. Thank you, Sophie. So follow, following this subject about the the streaming and digital life. Uh, Ana Mateo, uh, from the, she's the president from the Spanish Association of Orchestras. She's asking to Maria Grunman in Sweden, can we live on digital and streaming? Do you see any treats in this regarding the live performance? If we can live only on that, is that a question? Or if you can see any treats in this, Regarding and the the and positive performance. effects. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Like many of you, like Juan Antonio also said, this is a, a, a fantastic opportunity to show that there is an interest in this, and it's a huge, big audience out there. But not as an alternative, but as a um, something extra. It's, it's when you can't reach the the uh, the concert halls like now. It is something that it's an alternative. But afterwards, I think it will. It will be both. It will be a way to, to enter this world and it will be for people who can't actually go there because they are old or sick or live far away, but there will always be people who want to also uh, mm -hmm. go to the live concerts. But I think we will have to, and that discussion has started in Sweden now, how to find ways of also um, uh, have um, tickets or sales digitally that you have to find different ways of both um, uh, season tickets or, or other ways of, of actually getting money in this way. It can't be something that is for free forever, but like other areas like the journalist sector or um, well other sectors, they start like this with two different words, the analog and the, the, the digital world, and then you they merge. And we are starting now discussions of both the technical sides, how we develop that to make this possibility to, to digitalize, to be more available for also the smaller orchestras. Uh, at the same time, we're starting the discussion on how to, to, get, um, to get money into the sector also. It is a special uh, challenge for, for our orchestras who are already publicly funded to again ask the public to pay for for the tickets, uh, but since we already do that for those who go to the concert, it's it shouldn't be a problem. But they ha that discussion has been for uh, at least the the Radio Symphony Orchestra. Uh, so was that? I don't know if that was the 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 question. 
Yes, yes, great. Thanks. Thanks, Maria. And following the same subject, this question is for Mark Pemberton. This is asked by Maria Gardolinska. She said, if I understood correctly, you said that one of the challenges that the British orchestras are facing is the difficulty and cost of setting up the digital infrastructure to start streaming performances. I know that many freelance musicians are coping with the same issue all over the world. I have heard about some startups planning on developing specialized digital tools for musicians to stream and monetize their streaming. Do you think that the existence of such a platform would facilitate things for the orchestras? I feel strongly for all musicians in Great Britain since I've worked on the Bournemouth Symphony Orchestra for the past two years. Uh, any high quality platform is going to be welcome. Part of the problem is that people are using platforms like YouTube or Facebook video, which are simply low quality. I've actually heard say that um, certainly when musicians are using their own iPhones, there are actually notes that will not be picked up by an iPhone. So we are actually giving our audiences a low quality product. So we need firstly to focus on how do we get better quality. And it's not just about concert presentation. We also are interested in how you monetize our learning and participation work. Because we also want to reach into care homes, reach into schools, which is something we've become extremely good at doing. And that work has stopped too. And digital is the only way in which we are going to be able to continue our connection with those essential settings. Um, so it's about having something which is easy for the audience to, um, to get onto, that has a simple monetization system. Maybe it's a subscription model rather than a pay to view. There's an awful lot of questions to be dealt with. I don't have the answers. I'm keen to hear if anybody has developed something that would work. Thanks, Mark. The next question is for Juan Antonio. Eh, Maria Marie Perez de la Orquesta Joven de Andalucía. She asks, are the orchestras going on with, with their academic programs for youth musicians and their face-to-face -face training? If not, which means are they using to guarantee a high quality online non-present training? Yes, that's one of the things that not, not so many orchestras do, that um, they get so involved with uh, the process of music education. Uh, one remarkable case is the Bogotá Philharmonic. Uh, they have developed a very strong program that goes through the school system with uh, schools, full, or full symphony orchestras within the school system as, as a part of the of the education of the public education in Bogota. Uh, I, they are struggling with this idea because of course we are used to the one um, on one presential uh, pedagogic uh, approach to, to teaching and learning music. Uh, but many orchestras, including the, the, the Colombian the Colombian uh, National Symphony Orchestra have developed a series of uh, very short videos that we, musicians are doing from home to those students of music. We have already published around 30 of those very short videos uh, which uh, address different issues from technical aspects to um, preparatory exercises to, to more uh, general questions about the instruments. Uh, some orchestras have been very successful with this in the past, like, like, the, like the Philharmonia Orchestra in, in, in London. They have developed very, very strong uh, digital um, educational material. I, I see, I know now, um, I, I discovered that the uh, Escuela Superior de Musica Reina Sofia in Madrid has developed as well a very smart uh, material to interact, interactive material for, for teaching and learning uh, online. So, and also some new, uh, applications have been developed for for the master class uh, format so i'm pretty sure we are going to find ways to uh, implement educational uh, new uh, forms of, of, of pedagogy using the orchestra resources and addressing needs of people uh, wanting to learn and wanting to connect one of the beautiful outcomes so far which is like a very a uh, short period of time to, to, to say so, but 
uh, is that we have a better interaction. There, we are we're opening every Wednesday. We have, for example, uh, an open discussion in Instagram, and we have had a many a number of a, a, a large number of students enrolled in those activities. Uh, just pretty much asking questions to musicians in the orchestra. We pick only two musicians at a time, and so that at, at least for us it gives us one little idea of how to uh, open the path for digital um, interaction with students during these times and maybe who knows maybe after the crisis is over we have gained uh, a new a new platform for for reaching out to communities thank you juan antonio and we would like to say uh we are very amazed to see all the countries and all the people from all around the world that is participating right now through the chat and we would like also to tell you that you can ask questions in Spanish you don't have to do it in English we can translate or Portuguese or uh, different many languages so try to write down the, the, the question in your language if you don't feel uh, secure to do it in English and we will translate it for the presenters and we also would like to recognize that uh, Marta Gardolinska, the, the one for the, 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 for the question before, she's right now one of the conducting fellows in Los Angeles Philharmonic. So, so good to see that we have people from all kinds of uh, prospects in, in the music business. So the next question is for Benedict. Uh, it's from Carolina Marquez from Medea Arts Management. Have you thought of a way of polling audiences to see what format and in which conditions they will feel safe enough to return to the halls? Um, no, um, I mean, as nobody knows uh, how how the situations will will develop. Um, I think it's it's uh, difficult at the moment to to get out to the audience and to 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 ask under which conditions you would be ready to come back on stage or in the in the venues i think this is something we have to to figure out um, um when it's when when this when the when the um, when it's time so when for us for instance when the venues open then we can see under which conditions we we can um, allow the audience and as a colleague said um I'm sure as uh, the, the audience is more on the on the elderly side, so um, they will be very careful to 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 come back to the venues um, in in the beginning. Um, maybe we can by then um, have a, have another audience, a, a younger audience, motivated by the all the online activities which are at the moment um, going on, and which maybe we, we can also um, adapt the programs um, uh, more to, to a more popular side um, and to, to attract um, and uh, I know for instance that American some American orchestras they are totally um, rescheduling their, their, their season and um, not doing so much uh, contemporary music maybe on the on the on the uh, um, core repertoire side um, just to to bring um, when the venues then open to bring um, 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 the known music back to the audience, not uh, and and maybe attract uh, another audience which which is not the normal audience for the venues. But uh, no, no, um, we didn't do research um, at the moment with the, with the audience. Uh, yeah, Sophie, would you like to take yeah. the question? Well, we have started doing, uh, we're, so we're surveying our audience. The first three, um, we're going to do it in three waves, and this is across the country, so it's a collaboration between um, government and orchestras. And um, so far, the results are very um, reluctant to come back in the hall if there's not uh, either a vaccine or uh, some really strong measures of hygiene and so on. Uh, the other thing we've started doing is uh, price sensitivity uh, research because and um, uh, Richard Bakers in the UK are are actually um, um, doing a major studies uh, across orchestra around the world uh, to see if our audience are 
will be sensitive to uh, pricing when we come back in the halls, especially if we come back with programs that are different, uh, smaller programs, like not playing Mahler anymore, but more uh, Mozart, Beethoven <laughs> size program, um, having also shorter program, no interval. Um, so it's quite interesting to see uh, results coming out. Uh, we will have a big shift, I think, in um, price sensitivity and uh, the behavioral uh, uh, behaviors of our audiences. Thank you, Sophie. Yeah, actually, we heard this morning in the European Orchestras Forum that Norway is also doing our research in that sense. So it will be very interesting to share all these results later because we mm -hmm. will have to think about it. The next question is for Mark. Uh, from Maria Catalina Prieto from the Medellin Philharmonic Orchestra. She says, are orchestra musicians still being paid or have they had reductions? And what about the administrative staff? So as I explained, we have two schemes, one for employed workers, one for self-employed. Um, orchestras that have salaried musicians uh, they have furloughed 90% of their staff, including all the musicians. So um, you can see that uh, the musicians will now be limited to a monthly salary through the state of two and a half thousand pounds a year maximum. Um, yeah. So that will mean some potential reduction in their earnings. And on the self-employed scheme, the government selects who gets it. So the so for self-employed musicians, where of course there are no longer any concerts they're going to be paid for, they will, with luck, be getting money through that. Um, it's better than nothing. Um, but uh, there are, however, some orchestras that have chosen not to furlough their musicians. This is where the amount of public subsidy they get is greater than the amount of earned income they would have expected. And they feel an obligation to actually retain their musicians. And that gives them an advantage because they can then do more digital work. Thanks, Mark. Uh, we have one question for Maria. This is from Fabiane Krauser from Classical Next in Germany. She asks, are you developing new concert formats and what could they look like? Well, the, the thing I know is that now they are adapting the formats for this uh, pandemic situation. Like I said, they have uh, 45 musicians on stage, which means like, for instance, they had a planned concert where Alan Gilbert was supposed to, to um, have the, the first symphony of Schumann and instead they have to change it for the for Haydn's 8 8 symphony because of the settings. So that is one thing. But then uh, I don't think it's a new format. I mean, it's chamber music. Uh, there are smaller groups and they have two different film teams and one is specialized in streaming and the other is making films of chamber music. So I think it's what, like Mark said before, the, the quality is very important, of course, if this is going to be a long term. Um, part of the of the orchestra's um, production and then they that's what I said before you, you can see new companies new expert developing in uh, collaboration with the orchestras and maybe there will be new formats but for the moment I think it's more like finding the technical um, skills or, or um, formats for different kinds of music it's still the same music that's what I what I hear. Maybe the playing outdoors for for the elderly, setting up tents on the street, that is a new format, but I think that will disappear when the, when the situation changes. Thanks, Maria. And talking about new formats, this question is for Sophie from Francesca Calero. Do you see new collaborations between the music industry and other sectors that had not happened before, such as, for example, working closely with the science or engineer community to investigate ventilation systems in the halls? Um, actually, yes, we, well, I, it's very interesting subject. And I, I think we all should <laughs> start working with uh, the scientific community 
and we have engaged with the chief scientist of Australia, uh, with uh, one of our subscribers actually, so I likes classic music on um, actually maybe being a guinea pig with the halls where we perform on what can we do to um, improve um, hygienic settings so that we are in, um, able to reassure our audience that uh, we're doing everything we can. So we're looking at that right now. Uh, I think it's a good idea. <laughs> Thanks, Sophie. Uh, this question is for Mark from Ana Mateo from Maeus, Spain. How it's affecting this situation is affecting sponsorship and the relationship with donors? Mm. Uh, it's having quite a, a bad effect because obviously a lot of the philanthropic money that comes in is linked to activity. It is to support a concert season. It or, or often it's to support learning and participation work. If that work is not happening, therefore the, the gift is no longer valid. So yes, we have seen a downturn uh, in our contributed income, which adds to the problem of the disappearance of all earned income. Thank you. We have one question for Juan Antonio from Darius for Far Holman. I hope it's pronounced like that from the United States. Uh, question What do you envision the future of live performances looking like as a result of the current situation we are facing? Do you see your organization resuming in the fall with the reinvent of moving forward full steam ahead or not? Uh, yes, I think there will be a change in the format. I think because if we do, uh, if we are successful doing the digital and TV uh, show format, then the audiences are going to change a little bit. Uh, and they are going to find interesting not only the orchestra, but also the venue, because the venue will have, will become uh, as something that is. Uh, very appealing to people who have never been in a, in a venue like that. So we have to be open to different formats. What I think, for instance, is that the performances are going to be shorter uh, and with no intermission. That's that's one of the aspects that I that I see might change. Other things that might change, that it's more informal in terms of the relationship with with the audience. People that uh, that that would. Be more more come and go a situation for the audience the the performances being uh more fresh more uh with a, a lot more variety um uh, with some digital elements within uh and also what is going to change is the expectation campaigns for those performances if we opened if we open a channel uh through tv or to uh, social media that is functioning for a number of months during the crisis and, and we keep going with those, then the expectations for a performance could increase and then the, the ways to announce those performances are going to be different. So yes, I think we are going to end up with a, a different way of performing and a different way of uh, relating to the audience. Thank you, Juan Antonio. We have one question for Mark. Europe has a history of large-scale health-related issues, not to mention devastating, devastating wars. Looking back at history, what lessons can we learn from these events that could shed positive light into the short to mind term before the, the term future of the performing arts? That was clear? That is an extremely difficult question. Now, obviously, looking at the history of the 20th century, yes, we have, there have been two world wars. There have been recessions. There was the global financial crash only uh, in 2008. We did get through them. The difference is that in all those circumstances, you did not see the deliberate shutdown of live entertainment by the government. Throughout those wars, music continued and music was seen as a mechanism to lift the nation's spirits. So this is unprecedented and this is why it is such a challenge to understand what the long-term prognosis is and what the long-term impact will be. So yes, let's be optimistic. Orchestras have survived any number 
of difficult periods of history. I'm hoping that this will prove to be another one of those. And talking about this, this um, health issues, for example, uh, we we are having, you know, this this first session was to talk about the general situation in each country, but in the following sessions, we will go deep in other issues like the health security and the protocol security protocol measures, also communication in ways of doing concerts, so we can go more through this in, in the upcoming sessions and i think we have time just for one more questions and we we will have to start closing so this one is for sophie mm -hmm. ruben from spain asked what measures are you thinking to apply on stage related to social distancing something specific in wind sections of the orchestras mm, good question um, so at this point in time in, here in Australia, it's four square meter, uh, 1.5 meter between each person. And that means your orchestra is really spread out. Uh, we are using uh, Goodyear sound shields uh, for, for, to protect the earring of our musician. Um, and uh, we're thinking of adapting the, something to the sound shield so that there's even more protection for the musician in the woodwind section and the brass at the back and so on. But I think there's a, um, Mark is lifting his hand. <laughs> yes, Mark. Uh, well, in fact, yeah, Natalie will know that we, we heard this morning that there is some German research that's underway that has tracked the aerosol distribution of, part, part of the particles, um, which is actually reassuring that they do not travel as far as might be thought. Because what in Germany, we heard the staggering problem that their health insurance uh, comp, uh, organization has issued guidance that suggests there has to be a 12 meter distance between wind players. Um, and they are now fighting that and using this research to prove that actually a two meter distance is, is absolutely fine. And there's no evidence that brass instruments are actually particularly bad woodwind potentially it's the voice that we're now turning our attention to how far do singers project the particles and that does need more research thanks mark so this is about time we are at 8 30 right now so i would like to thank you all for this super inspiring and, and very interesting uh debate I'm going to let you with Gosha, but she will give us some more information for the upcoming sessions. Thank you, Natalie, and thank you all the wonderful panelists. This was a very, very interesting discussion, and I'm sure that we could go on for hours like this. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise and ideas. I would like to invite all of you to our upcoming sessions. And uh, the nearest one is happening on May 14, Protecting Audiences and Artists, Public Health. And among uh, the uh, panelists invited to participate are representatives of Performing Arts Employers Association, League of Europe, Singapore Symphony Group and uh, Orquesta Sinfonica del Principado de Asturias, as well as Teatro del Lago de Chile, as well as public health representatives. I encourage you to join this session and stay with us throughout uh, the, all the events in May. I would also like to invite you today, if you don't have enough, um, to join our continuing education series. Uh, we have Sue Hoyle from Chlor Leadership uh, who will talk about changing the culture of leadership and leadership of culture. The moderators for this discussion are Dr. Mark Chocho from New England Conservatory and Katya Gorbatyuk from London Symphony Orchestra. This is happening just in 30 minutes. You can join in through our website, um, globalleaders.com, um, globalleadersprogram.com, and uh, we all hope to see you there. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. Have a good day. Have a great afternoon. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.